Yeah. So yeah, please interrupt me and correct me and, it's a and add, add to the discussion. Yeah, it's more like a discussion. It didn't, wasn't intended to be a, a lecture on the wheeler the equation. So, um, well, um, <coughs> the wheeler the width equation is supposed to be the equation for uh, for gravity. So it's the equation for the wave functional of gravity, where we think of the variables as the space-time metric. Um, now, it has some peculiar features, and to understand these peculiar features is useful first to... Um, these peculiar features are due to the time reparametrization symmetry of the problem, of the GR, and uh, these peculiar features are present in other systems that have time reparametrization symmetry. So it's useful just to, uh, to recall how uh, these systems are quantized and what, what happens in these systems. So the simplest system uh, is a relativistic particle. So there uh, we can write the action uh, as uh, you know e to the minus one. So introducing let's say well sheet metric. Um, so we have uh, these uh, fields on the on the world. On, so these are the x mu coordinates. Um, Plus, uh, the signs are not going to be correct, so don't worry about the signs. Um, so we can think of this as the metric, and uh, this as the dynamical variables, and we have the uh, time reparametrization symmetry. If we, when we ch change time, we change e as uh, you know a, a, a metric, well, or the square root of a metric. Um, so in this system, if uh, so, you can um, calculate uh, the equations of motion for x. They will tell you that. Uh, they will tell you that p mu is conserved, right? p mu, which is x dot divided uh, <coughs> by e to the minus 1. And then we can also calculate the equation of motion for e. And the equation of motion for e is uh, giving us that p squared plus uh, m squared uh, is equal to 0, right? So the, the equations for motion of motion for e are a constraint. So they're constraining the values of, uh, of this. It's not a dynamical equation. Um, and so that's uh, classically, um, and quantum mechanically, we uh, can uh, we can quantize uh, the system by, for example, choosing a gauge for e. So we set e to one, and then uh, p mu uh, are the momenta conjugate to x mu. Uh, but then uh, we have to remember to put in this constraint. So we we'll have uh, this constraint uh, that came from uh, the equation of motion for e. And the constraint is just the usual uh, standard Klein-Gordon equation. Um, okay. Um, now, one uh, one feature of the Klein-Gordon equation is that, uh, um, well, the the norm. So we are used to wave functions, and we think normally that the probabilities are measured by psi squared. Uh, but that's not uh, what we should do here. Um, in this case, what we should define the norm in terms of. Uh, or the inner product between two wave functions, but let us let's speak the same wave function. So we should, what we should do is we should uh, integrate not over all of space time, but only over a surface with constant x zero. So we fix x zero to some constant, um, and then we integrate uh, d three x, okay, and then we take the wave function, uh, and uh, we take d zero while acting on both sides and psi. So we take the Klein-Gordon norm, and that's uh, what we should do. Um, so that's, you know, since uh, this is a discussion, I think I might object. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> okay, yeah. I mean, I, I, I think that when you say that's what we should do, there's a question of what physics you want to get out of this. Of course, that's the thing we do to make contact with quantum field theory and so forth. Yeah. But if you were treating this as a system that really existed and was physical by itself, then I would object that the norm you wrote down is, of course, not positive definite. Yes, yes, that's right. And one has to fool with that and do all kinds of things. Yes. So probably I will just stop there and make that comment yes, yes, because yes. this is not no, really that, where that, you want to That's an important comment. I was, yeah. But I, there, I are, should... there are better definitions of a norm for that system to thought of as a thing in and of itself ah, with a okay. positive definite good, good. structure. Right. Please tell me what the better definition is. Do those definitions also make contact to the target space interpretation? Or? Well, okay, so I'll just tell you that the, the, the better definition yeah. is um, if you do choose to integrate over the time direction as well with the usual L2 norm, of course, you get a divergent answer for those solutions. Mm -hmm. But there's a sense in which that divergence is just um, a delta function in energy evaluated at zero. 
And there's a reasonable method for sort of throwing that delta function away. And in this context, it reduces to what's actually a kind of like the absolute value of the Klein-Gordon norm, where it agrees with the Klein-Gordon norm on positive frequency states and is minus the Klein-Gordon norm, a positive thing, on negative frequency states. So that's something which comes directly from the natural Hilbert space structure on the system before you impose the constraint. You can view it as kind of sticking in a delta function of the Hamiltonian operator in the right place that imposes the constraint, and it all works out nicely and gives you a positive definite answer. Okay, so I leave it to Eva to tell me whether that makes contact with this target space interpretation. Um, it certainly is not the way you would build up a first quantized version of quantum field theory, but it makes a fine quantum mechanical system and generalize it. For example, if you wanted to take this model and generalize it to what are often called mini superspace models of quantum cosmology, I would argue that this is a good way to go and it avoids all of these age old problems of dealing with the Klein Gordon inner product and in cosmological context. So suppose I put in a potential that depended on X mu? Yes. Um, so that there's now mixing between the positive and negative energy states. Right. So is there a, a, a quantum mechanics of that system? Yes. With a positive norm? Yes. The, the norm that I just described for you is still positive definite. Okay. So and it has the kind of physics you would expect, that if you have a potential that, for example, increases, quote, towards the future, so that the target space interpretation particles, to classical trajectories would bounce off and go backwards in time. This sounds funny, but if you write, if you transform this mathematical model into a cosmological context, this is exactly what happens for cosmologies that start at a big bang, expand for a while, and then like to recollapse, things like k equals plus one Robertson Walker. And the norm I just gave you mirrors that physics. It gives you wave functions that are normalizable in this norm that have support at values near the cosmological singularity. They don't allow the wave function to have support at large values of the radius, and it all looks great. Are there zero norm states around? Are there zero norm states around? Um, that's a matter of definition, but clearly in the correct definition, you quotient it by those and get rid of them. The, the zero norm things states. that we normally think of as being physical, and you're going to all the things which are solutions to that constraint equation give you positive norm states. So, so, sorry, I had a similar question to Tom's with the particle production. Yeah. Exactly. So, so if in quantum field theory, of course, a particle can split into two. Right. That. How do you fit that into this description? It doesn't happen in this description. As I say, this okay. is not the right physics for doing quantum field theory. Okay. Good. But it is the right physics for mirroring for having a semi-classical limit like you see in recollapsing cosmologies where classically the universe does not split into two. It simply bounces off a potential wall and comes back towards the Big Bang. Okay, this does I, I, I thought Tom was asking about a time-dependent field theory where you would have pair production of particles. Tom asked about a, a question with the time-dependent potential, and my point is you could interpret that in two ways. If you think about it as a time-dependent field theory, what I've just said is the wrong physics and should not be applied. If you think about it as a simplified model of cosmology, perhaps for quantum gravity purposes, it gives what I will claim is a very natural quantum physics, whether it's the right physics we can discuss separately. So that was a small technical comment. Uh, well, I, I, think, I think it's important to, to know what, uh, what we should do. So I, here I've... Uh... Oh, yeah, since, since this came up, I will just mention as an aside that you can also argue that this is a reasonable inner product just from some sort of path integral argument. Maybe if you have a reference where that's explained, I could put it in the blackboard so that people... Uh, yeah. Um, Your PhD thesis for that? Or? <laughs> <laughs> that's one place. It's <laughs> PhD okay. thesis. Okay. <laughs> no, that's not, that's not the best reference. Alternative. Um, There's a paper I wrote called Group Averaging, Where Are We Now? or something like that from about 10 years ago that is a reasonable first reference and contains many other references. Group Averaging. As long as we're doing that, I should maybe mention <laughs> yes. that you know, it also fits into what's called this generalized quantum mechanics framework where you deal yes. with histories. 
And then the objective is to construct a decoherence functional, and it's best done with exactly the inner product Don is describing. So if you have a world line, and be, but then you can couple that to uh, fields. The idea is the world line would be a simple model of a, a geometry. You can couple it to fields and produce particle production. Just like and Jim and I have a lovely paper on that from some years right. ago that in particular explains the connection to the Klein board and dorm well. So. Okay. So, so sorry to sort of belabor this more, but the existence of these two options means we don't know if there should be topology changing processes in this 1D world because you can make sense of either possibility. Is that right? Is that what you're saying? Well, it could also be that the, the two more or less coincide in the semi-classical limit. Well, that's not true. And, I mean, the okay. example here uh, is, is when you have something like a cosmology that wants to recollapse, which is a potential that increases in what you think of as the future direction for your particle. At those classical turning points, where you would think physics is still semi-classical, descriptions do not coincide. Well, but it, it, it might be that the, there it's just that you chose your time variable incorrectly. If you, you choose the, I know, some kind of extrinsic curvature time no, variable. No, no, no. You don't have to choose a variable for either of these. The klein gordon inner product is covariant, doesn't require a choice of coordinates. And the description I gave is also covariant, does not require a choice of coordinates. The physics really is different, and it's what Eva said. At those places where a classical cosmology would want to recollapse, the klein gordon description wants to give some kind of particle production or you know, universe production, third quantization. The one that I described wants to describe things that turn around. Okay. And so, by the way, that, so, so, that's so, so. not necessarily interactions of universes, like particle interactions, but it, it's just saying you can have sort of pair production when you reach the turning point. It's pair production in an external potential. Yeah. That's correct. Mm -hmm. And it basically has to do with, well, okay. So we could then discuss, it, it, but mathematically, they're both consistent interpretations. That's right. One of which has behavior that very much that if you had a classical cosmology, is very behavior is very non-semi-classical at that point. Okay, and the other is very semi-classical. So the difference between the two, that's more than the matter of interpretation, is what sort of things you allow uh, as a uh, well, what ecosystem? Or what, how do you how do you manage to get such a large? In part, it's because what states you allow. I mean, let me just explain, right? Um, if you have something like the Klein-Gordon norm which is by construction conserved, and if you're interested in solutions that have, say, a positive frequency, so the norm is non-zero, then um, suppose in the target space there, there's a potential that increases toward the future. Okay, well, if you start with some non-zero Klein-Gordon norm, no matter how far up you evolve, the norm must remain non-zero. So your wave function doesn't vanish in the far future. So in this Klein-Gordon type of approach, you naturally have a lot of support in a region that's classically forbidden. Whereas the other approach, which is based on basically the L2 norm, um, even though it's got a renormalization in it, uh, suppresses wave functions in the far future where they would have to grow exponentially under this potential. Okay, so that's a lot of what happens, is the two different kinds of norm pick out different classes of states as being normalizable. Can I ask a quick question? If you follow just like the geometric quantization algorithm for this, which norm would you generally pick out? Does that correspond to the Klein-Gordon norm? Or? So you have to remind me how this works for a gauge system. Geometric quantization, is, is it basic? Uh, I understand what that means if you basically, quote, deparameterize the theory first and you apply geometric quantization. Okay. If that's what you mean, um, that is equivalent that's basically equivalent to the norm that I was describing as opposed to Klein-Gordon norm. Oh, okay. Yeah. So then why is the, how does, how do you naturally get a Klein-Gordon norm then? Like where is, is that just, well I guess that's what we're doing here. Is, is it coming from imposing the constraint? Is that? The constraint is a Klein-Gordon-like equation. You it's may choose to the Klein-Gordon yeah, norm. Well, it has the advantage that well, you, you evaluate it at some fixed times and so it agrees with uh, what we get in non-relativistic theory. That's right. So, yeah. It, it is worth saying that the Klein-Gordon norm is exactly conserved in this sense, mm -hmm. whereas the norm that I described can't be evaluated at a fixed time. As a result, you know, right. the part of the wave function, as I said, is not conserved. It, right. it can right. disappear right. in the far future. So it's a question of your context whether or not that's the right physics. Right. right. So, sorry for the long No problem. Question. That's that's very useful. Thank you. Yeah. Please see. I mean, from a four dimension, if you formulate quantum mechanics four dimensionally in you know, Feynman, it's a question of what the basic paths are. Right, if you assume that they're can go up and backward in time, which I guess you would read as 
of sort of production. That gives you one theory. If you assume they're single valued in some particular time of some frame, that gives you another one. Yeah, um, we can perhaps postpone this discussion. Maybe, well, okay. Let, let me Sorry. say a couple of more things, and I think this, this issue will come out when we discuss second context, third contextation and so on. Um, so if we take this norm, so I just remind you that uh, we can go to the non-relativistic approximation. So the non-relativistic approximation consists in taking the psi to be equal to e to the i m x zero times uh, psi non-relativistic that depends on x zero and x. Okay, um, and then uh, when you do that, you can insert it here, and so the m term cancels, and you get the standard uh, Schrödinger equation, right? And um, so the, the Klein-Gordon equation becomes the Schrödinger equation, which is first order in time. So the x0 psi equal to the gradient in the spatial direction psi. Right? So we get this equation. And the norm becomes the usual norm. So this norm becomes, again, the norm, uh, which is um, the standard norm for the non-relativistic um, non -relativistic, uh, particle. Right, D3x. Okay, so that yeah, so that was uh, one reason for thinking about this norm is that in this non-relativistic approximation becomes the standard norm of uh, ordinary quantum mechanics. Um, so does the other I will just comment. Okay, so yeah, so that I think is something that well, any any, any norm that you choose I think has to obey this. I'm not sure how that one obeys, but. Uh, it does, yeah. Well, you said that it agrees with the Klein-Gordon norm for uh, for very positive frequency. Yeah, so in this case, and then, and then yeah. So yeah. So this is a requirement for any situation that we have. Now imagine. So that was uh, one particle. So we could uh, just consider a system of uh, many, let's say, n non-interacting particles, n Klein-Gordon particles, right? So then we will have exactly the same thing, except that we'll have a bunch of uh, a bunch of uh, x mu's, right? So we have uh, now many times, um, and so we have a wave function, which is a function of uh, those times um, and the spatial coordinates, right? So alpha runs over all the particles, and again uh, we uh, there we, we have the, the analog of the Klein-Gordon norm is. Uh, a norm where we integrate again only over the spatial coordinates of the particles, d3x, and then we have the full wave function, and we have to take the product of all alphas of the zero uh, of the zero component, right, of all the alphas. <coughs> so that would be the analog of the Klein-Gordon norm for this system um, of many particles. Right? Okay, so that's. Uh, and again, here we would just set that x uh, alpha zero would be some constant that might depend on alpha. Okay, and so we uh, we have the subspace in which we are computing the Klein-Gordon norm. And um, okay, so now uh, we go back to gravity. So so now we do gravity. Um, and um, well, there are uh, various ways to think about it, but so one uh, one thing we could do is uh, we can expand the uh, action in the ADM form. Um, <coughs> so this is a standard and uh, in this analogy, so we'll won't discuss uh, DNIs and the spatial reparametrizations very much. I think Guillermo will discuss that a little, that a little more. Uh, but I'll focus more on the time reparametrization issues. Um, so we can think of uh, the n being, uh, yeah, being analogous more or less to the metric uh, that was appearing here, the e. Um, and that will impose a certain constraint. Uh, so we can think of the dynamic, so let me say more organized. So we can think of the dynamical variable as this uh, three-dimensional metric. And then uh, the equations of motion for n and an I will impose uh, constraints. So we can do the quantization by uh, put, putting a gauge for n uh, and an I, um, and then imposing the resulting uh, the equations of motion as constraints on this wave function that would depend only on G. Okay. 
So uh, if we do this, then uh, the equations for the n and ni uh, translate into um, constraints. Um, so the equation for ni uh, gives us um, the reparameterization constraints, uh, which are essentially saying that if we change this metric, I mean, we do a spatial reparameterization here, the, the wave function. I mean, they're saying exactly that. The wave function doesn't change. Um, and then we also have the equation for n, which uh, gives us the so-called Hamiltonian constraint, which uh, is an equation which has a rough form of, so, so we take the diagonal component of the metric and we have a second derivative with a minus sign, and then we have the other uh, components of the metric, uh, roughly speaking, give us a positive term in, the, in the, this Hamiltonian constraint. And then there is some spatial curvature here and so on. Sorry, equal. So the important point uh, here to point out is that this operator uh, in, the, in the field space has uh, some negative directions. So similar to <coughs> negative directions that we were getting uh, here in the clan gordon equation that we got uh, dx0 squared plus dxi squared. Right? And this x0 is uh, this essentially the scale factor of the metric. So that's the negative direction. Um, OK, so um, in analogy with uh, what was done for the Klein-Gordon equation, one option would be to, to use, again, the Klein-Gordon norm. Um, or you could use other norms, uh, as um, Don was saying. I guess I'm more familiar with the Klein-Gordon one. Actually, so to raise a question, um, about the Klein-Gordon, one of the things that physically tells us we're dealing with a multi-particle theory and not a single particle theory is sort of the physics around the Klein paradox. I guess that's related to mm -hmm. what yes. we were just saying. Yes. So, so how do you think about the resolution of the Klein paradox if you're using the, the other norm? Uh, so if you're trying to do it. Maybe that's equivalent to what you said. It is. For a single particle theory, yeah. OK, the other norm that I gave, stated gives a crazy resolution to the Klein paradox. It says, it, it, I believe in some versions of it, it says the particle comes in and literally turns around and goes backward in time and disappears. Okay. Okay. Mm -hmm. All right. Which, if you want to talk about particles in the presence of external potentials, that's the wrong physics. Right. But there's an analog of that in certain cosmological models you can write down where that is the classical mm -hmm. physics. That it's you not want. Yeah. Or yeah. So you don't want paraprint production. Yeah. So that's, that's the difference. Yeah. Okay. May I ask a silly question? Uh, why using th this kind of norm? Uh, why, why can't we just use uh, the Hamiltonian as the norm? Could you re repeat the question? I didn't the hear Hamiltonian the as a norm. Yeah, uh, if we uh, know the direction of time, we can define uh, well, the Hamiltonian. Ah. We can use it. For, uh, yeah, the, the, Hamil norm. the Hamiltonian is zero, right? So this is this is the Hamiltonian, right? I think, are you talking about deparameterizing, you know, just picking a gauge and choosing yeah, a time? Yeah, gauge. Yeah, that's all yeah, for that's yeah. usual. Yeah, that's what Juan did in that semi-classical in that upper there. Did uh, you see him? Oh, I mean, maybe I, I, I just misunderstood. I just didn't. But uh, it's the first derivative. No. So the, 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 the issue is that the, the original equation involves second derivatives in time, right? Yeah. And the formal Hamiltonian is actually zero, right? So this is the Hamiltonian conjugate to uh, ta these time translations. And so oh. because the system was reparameterization invariant, the Hamiltonian is zero. And, uh, yeah. Can I ask a very naive question yes. for shown by ignorance? Is, is the targets, that is, our string theories, do they contain a time reparameterization invariance or some symmetry that's like that? Yes. And if so, how are they represented in the dual? Um, well, that's a good question. It's a hard question. <laughs> 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 the short answer is only gauge invariant quantities are related. So the oh. gauge groups look different on the two right. sides. Right. So you don't see the time reparameterization in the dual. But it's there somehow. Yeah, I, I, I was planning to discuss more of the ideas. Could we postpone this question? Well, of course, we could we can. postpone this question. <laughs> well, yeah, maybe. Um, OK, so um, 
Here again, one can formally do the same Klein-Gordon norm. Uh, so it would be an integral over all metrics, but you have to pick a, a slice where the scale factor is some function that you choose, right? Uh, and then you take psi, and then you take the product uh, with respect to the, the derivatives with respect to the scale factor, product over all x, uh, psi, and that would be your norm. Um, now, you might be a little suspicious of this product over all points, and <laughs> I'm, in general, if you are going to expand uh, around the semi-classical solution, so e to the classical action, right? times uh, psi, uh, this would be the psi usual. So this is the usual th one that we use in quantum field theory or perturbative quantization around the, the given background. That's the wave function which will obey the Schrodinger equation. And this would be functions of the metric and so on. <coughs> so if you pick a situation like this, then the dominant terms in this derivative come from this classical action. And this is just the product of functions which we just drop as a measure factor in field theory. So that's, uh, that is the usual. Uh, well, that's one approach one can take that would uh, make sense in, in any of the semi-classical regimes. Um, now, um, OK, so that's, I think, uh, more or less the usual, uh, well, some of the usual story with uh, Willard the Wicked. I'm sure there are many more things one could say, like different choices of norm and, and so on. Um, I was going to say a few things about the mini superspace approximation, but before that, um, I'd like to say a few uh, few things that people normally say about this. Um, so there are some criticisms to this approach to quantum gravity, um, and so one criticism is that well, you know, it's not a normalizable theory. We shouldn't be doing this. Um, I think uh, this is not uh, quite so. We, we could be doing this in a normalizable theory, like uh, the uh, two-dimensional quantum gravity, which uh, is on the worst of strings. And, um, and so it, this is not an issue. We could wonder where that is the correct uh, approach in that situation. Um, we would wonder about the norm and why we had negative norms. Uh, and Don told us there is some way of dealing with that. Um, but more generally, in uh, Quantum field theory, we know that uh, the correct uh, way to do this, well, to, to treat the Klein-Gordon equation, or at least the correct way, is to uh, second quantize, so to consider the many particle system. And um, so also in uh, when we do 2D quantum gravity, when we do string theory, we also do, uh, do that, uh, let's say, second quantization. This context is called third quantization. But, uh, so. Um, so should we also uh, third quantize and think uh, think about theories of many universes and so on? So people have speculated about these ideas, and I think there's no, no clear answer. Yeah. Yeah. Let, there's one um, yes. important um, new thing that happens once you allow the, uh, the the space time to have more than zero dimensions, like in the particle case. So in the particle case, you know you get the Klein paradox and so on in an external potential. But in, in string theory or anything that involves you know, higher dimensional universes, if I think about trying to define things in terms of a Euclidean path integral over the variables, then these geometries where things split really can't be ruled out because you if, if I take any geometry and I, I take any choice of what the time surface is, there will be some perfectly smooth geometries for which the time surfaces intersect the geometry in two separate, yeah, the picture that one just drew there. Yeah, and you can't say... avoid uh, vertices like that at all. In, in the in the smooth case, in the, in the Euclidean case, because you know if you choose any particular geometry, there will be some time surface for which it splits like that, mm -hmm. and so that's sort of the reason that in string theory, the different topologies are kind of all connected together, mm -hmm. and you can only you can only um, turn them off if you make the theory completely non-interacting. 
So, right. but, but yeah, so it's space two. time, not interrupting. It's space time, yes. Yeah. But, but I'm still confused by Don's alternative. Sorry, really sorry mm -hmm. to everyone understand. But right. do you give up his closed universe if you do this one, the one that allows the splitting? Yeah. Well, you could have a string that just uh, oscillates and collapses. Right? Yeah, I would think you should be able to yeah, have sure. it. Yeah, I thought there was a story so where you have both the expanding and collapsing into of interacting. Well, yeah, that's what I'm trying to understand is what... Yeah. Well, okay, you can have expanding and, and collapsing universes, and indeed, I mean, you're forced to mix them both. both you Sorry, know, I mean, time I, I, directions up. In, we, you know. we do know this in normal string theory. <laughs> right. Yeah. There so are those solutions. Yes. But it's just that G is weak, that's why. Yeah. Right. Yeah, so, right. So, two comments with regard to what Tom just said. So, first of all, if you're really Lorentzian, I, I'm not yeah. sure. No, there's a, that's right. Oh, if you're Lorentzian, you there are issues yeah. with singularities in those. Right. Yeah. Things. So, they're special if yeah. you have. Spring. Right. And I would add that then, the, I think well, in the. Finish. Oh, okay, go ahead. I was going to say that I think in the quantization I was talking about, if applied to a string, it wouldn't give the right physics for other reasons. But I think it would still have the property that there's a Euclidean path integral formulation and that it has this, and that because of what Tom said, you would see what looks like splitting in that context. So, so how would you interpret that in your one universe? Also looked at from the generalized quantum mechanics. It would be a, it, it'd be a local effect. Fine, as you say, locally, it would look like as splitting. You take. But there's some boundary condition that tells you you're just integrating over things that have two endpoints instead of three. And there might be a, there might also be it might also come with a global constraint on the topology. I, I I guess the question that I'd want to ask about things like that is yeah. could. You're, you're claiming that you're going to define some set of amplitudes yeah. from a connected universe to a connected universe. Are, yeah. or is, is that set of amplitudes supposed to satisfy unitarity, as in quantum mechanics? Because if it is, I think you're going to have a problem, because when you cut tell it, you what, see the intermediate tell me states. what you mean by them. unitarity. I mean that there's a set of states huh? defined on that single universe yes. that there are initial states, there are final states, and there are the no transition final, amplitude. No, they're, they're just states. They're, they're all Heisenberg states. They're not initial versus final states. It's not a scattering problem. It's not a scattering problem. No, in okay. the So, so the, 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 the notion of time in quantum mechanics and of transition is something that only appears semi-classically in correct. this formula? Yeah, correct. As you, would ex as you might expect for a system with zero formal Hamiltonian. Again, if, if, if you really have particles or strings with a target space, there's a natural notion of scattering, there's a natural notion of time. If you but take that away... On, on the other hand, if there's a classical background, then there's this other approach in which we would all agree, you know, you get a definition of time and you get a Schrodinger equation, and we, to all orders in the expansion around the classical solution, we never have to think about the... The, the funny norm that you define, right? Because we're expanding. But well, he's claiming the funny norm agrees with this norm in the non relativistic yeah, exactly. approximation. Exactly. So, we, so it's end of the story. That's, so it's it. the That's same right. Thing. right. So. Um, yeah, so I think. Yeah. Well, actually, there's one it's other different. small coupling. I think yeah. this is the whole one. So here we have a coupling constant that can suppress topology change, namely right. the string right. coupling. And in higher dimensions, you can also <coughs> have similar things, say a coupling constant multiplying the Euler character or whatever. Uh, and that's something you can tune to zero to shut it off, for example. So, I, I mean, I want to stress, I would, I can tell you exactly what this inner product is and how it works exactly for finite dimensional quantum mechanical systems. Obviously, gravity is a whole other story. And I would not want to use the properties of this inner product for the particle case to argue against topology change or something like third quantization <coughs> for gravity necessarily. But it does seem to me that the naive Klein-Gordon type approach, which forces you to have universe production when a classical universe might want to just recollapse and change from expanding to contracting, that seems like the wrong physics. And so I might hope that a better story would be based on something like the other inner product with some extra topology change thrown in somehow. Yeah. And I say somehow. I do not pretend to understand the story. <laughs>
Now you can you can ask uh, the question of what string theory or ADSCFT say about uh, these questions, which I think was uh, related to James' question. So the so always in, in all the problems we do normally in, uh, in string theory or quantum theory, we are looking near the boundary, near the boundary of the system, and we are definitely in the in this non-relativistic approximation. So we can have a classical background and we expand around that classical background. And that classical background is at least if it's well defined asymptotically. So, um, and um, okay, so we can do that asymptotically, and then there we have some natural question of what the observables are, what we're doing, and so on. Uh, but we don't know how to uh, take that and what lessons to extract about this. So, what is the right norm that uh, string theory tells us that we should do? Is, is this is the is it the one that uh, uh, Don was talking about, or is it the Klein Gordon norm, or exactly which one it is. This is a question we, at least I don't understand and don't know how to deal with it. Um, so, okay. But, uh, so one point is that, uh, so suddenly whatever you do in this non-relativistic approximation, it should reduce to the standard thing. That's a physical constraint that any proposed solution should, should, should have. Um, now, I, um, this wheeler the with equation is uh, normally used to discuss the mini superspace approximations, um, where uh, mini superspace approximation means, so superspace in this context means the space of metrics, and mini superspace is the, a metric which, uh, which contains only one variable, one dynamical variable, for example, the overall radius. Um, so, I'm sorry, Juan, is it? If not, what you're saying is not clear, for example, would be whether topology changing transitions that would be the analog of this particle production, yes, yes. whether that is or is not compatible with the dual field theory? For example, yeah, they are, yeah, so how should we interpret them? Yeah, the enabling they don't seem to be compatible, but. but okay, but you're not totally. Compatible with what? The, the, dual, the dual field, field theory. theory. So yeah. This is yeah. Okay, yeah, so let's discuss this issue. A problem of seemingly integrating over couplings and producing one. So in, in, in string theory, we can have a string, right? And if we were to reduce quantum gravity to a string that perhaps has some asymptotic boundary conditions, let's say some string that is stretched in some space, <coughs> and then you, you make uh, collisions, you can emit other strings that are, from the point of view of the two-dimensional theory, separate universes that do not uh, ever interact with the original string. Now, um, when we have a higher dimensional ADS solution, is it possible to send in here some uh, excitations and produce another universe which uh, somehow is completely disconnected with the original one that we had. Right? So if we, if we had this situation, then, uh, and, and well, in this situation, information can go from here to the other universes and can get lost and so on. So is that compatible with what happens uh, with ADS um, or not? And we, we think it's not compatible. Also here, this can carry energy away from the original universe. So the energy will also not be no, I don't think it can carry energy away because the the boundary conditions tell you that, that the energy is considered. If you if you break off, of well, it, it carries space-time energy. Okay, maybe that wasn't the right uh, for Yeah, yeah. The closed universe always has zero energy. So what's happening is that I'm process. I'm saying space-time energy, not, not L zero. So, sorry, no, let's not confuse these two things. Let's be clear. So L zero is always zero, right? In string theory, yeah. right. but maybe I misspoke and I should have said space-time energy. Certainly, this a closed string can carry space-time energy. In target space. Target space energy. Yeah, yeah, that's right. But over here, so this would be some other kind of energy, but it would still yeah, it would be some kind of energy. Yeah, yeah, this would conserve the ADS energy. Yeah. Yeah. But we think so. In the boundary field theory, we, yeah, we we don't think we have an infinite uh, asymptotic state uh, space of states with that finite energy. So, either. Uh, we can't allow this, these changes, or there is something very wrong in our present understanding of ADS um, Okay, so that was uh, one issue. Um, okay, any? So let's let's go back to the mini superspace story. Um, so here again, the only dynamics is here uh, for this uh, for the scale factor. So and. Um, and in this context, you can, uh, so you have a quantum mechanics theory, so you can put this into the Einstein action and you get a quantum mechanics theory, where, which uh, um, looks essentially like a Schrodinger problem where uh, A is the variable and um, 
we have an equation of the form dA squared plus some B of A equal to zero, right? Um, and then we can write down the effective potentials that we get for various uh, actions. And so uh, one that's been studied a lot is the case of the sitter. So if we take the sitter and if this is a three sphere, then uh, we get an effective potential of this kind. We are interested in energy equal to zero solutions. Um, so we have this and we're interested in this energy equal to zero solutions of this analog uh, Schrodinger problem. And, um, and those solutions uh, in this situation, uh, well, here in this, this is the allowed region, so they're oscillating in this region and they're exponentially damped in, uh, in the forbidden region. So this is the forbidden region, this is the, the, the allowed region. And of course, in the allowed region is where we can have also classical trajectories. And that indeed is the classical trajectory in the sitter space where A is equal to cos of time, right? So a solution that uh, comes in and goes back out. Um, and uh, the forbidden region is where we get Euclidean solutions. <coughs> the Euclidean solution in this case is just the metric of a sphere. Um, very good. And um, in this context, we can, um, and in principle, so this, this problem has uh, two solutions. Um, so there are two wave func possible wave functions. And um, so we qu the question is, well, how would we choose the, the right wave function? Uh, is, or is there, at least in this very simplified context, a way to choose the right wave function? And um, so, and Hartle and Hawking essentially proposed to uh, choose a wave function by saying that in the forbidden region, the action should be given by the, uh, just the Euclidean action uh, of uh, as a function of A. So you basically take the path integral over, uh, so we, we had the original sphere, uh, S4, right? And then we do the path integral up to, uh, essentially up to some value of the radius of the sphere, and that defines the wave function. The classical approximation is simply evaluating the Einstein action on a portion of the sphere. Uh, and so you can do that, and uh, that produces, since the action will start increasing as you, well, it will, will start change. it will be zero here, and it will start uh, becoming larger. Um, the behavior of that solution is, so it's an ex the exponential increase in uh, solution here in the uh, forbidden region, and then it starts uh, oscillating uh, in the allowed region, okay? Um, so, so in the original proposal, they wanted to take here the real solution, which is a combination of the, um, like a cosine, and then they couldn't apply the Klein-Gordon norm because it vanishes for a real solution. So they took the norm more in the style of what Don was saying. Um, but uh, since then, this proposal has also been used in other ways. I think in the more recent papers, they uh, essentially um, take a semi-classical wave function, which is given by doing, um, again, evaluating the classical action, but uh, on, uh, on a set of complex solutions in general, uh, or, or in a contour that contains, uh, um, let's say, the real time tau, uh, along which we have the cosine, and then you move uh, tau equal to zero, you move in imaginary time to the, uh, to the sphere, right? So it's a, it's a geometrically, we could write uh, this as uh, doing the path integral in Euclidean time up to <coughs> the equator of the sphere, and then uh, in Lorentzian time uh, in the future. And if we do this, then the solution that we get um, at uh, late times uh, behaves like e to the so it, it, it behaves in an oscillating fashion, so e to the i a, uh, a cube. Uh, and, um, and then this is the analog of the large mass term in the non-relativistic approximation, and, the, and then this will be multiplied by the wave function in the standard, so this is the usual wave function that we use in quantum field theory, usual, okay? Which uh, in this case is just a number, uh, but one uh, interesting aspect of the proposal is that one can uh, generalize this and do this even when you have small fluctuations. So even if we have small metric fluctuations, we would get here, uh, this prescription predicts at least at three levels, so it's, this is equivalent to the field theory at three level, uh, predicts uh, uh, the usual wave function for the small fluctuations. Um, okay, very good. So, um, 
So it's a, it's a proposal which reduces to the standard calculation, the standard choice of the Euclidean vacuum for, for example, cosmological correlators. Um, it can be, um, see, also it can be generalized to the case that you have also a scalar field. You, it's the same philosophy. Um, so we start in the future with some values of A and some values of the scalar field. And then you choose uh, a trajectory which can be, in this case, has a purely real and then imaginary part, but uh, in general it could be some complex contour uh, where the metric shrinks smoothly, and that uh, defines uh, this wave function in a complete way. And it gives, uh, as I said, the, the right uh, behavior. So if I say usual, I recall, recall that for small fluctuations, has uh, the form, uh, so m Planck squared um, over the radius, well, times uh, the integral with an important minus sign here, integral d cubed k. And just k. to make sure I understand, this is saying that there's not a unique wave function in the universe. Well, we'll discuss the uniqueness in a second. This, this, is, this is a choice that uh, gives the, uh, the standard answers. And, uh, no, I think what Eva is saying, yeah. if I'm if I may, is that there, you need a boundary condition on psi usual someplace in A in order to specify which. Oh, no, no, no. You know, the beautiful thing about this is that uh, you don't. This is a prescription. And the bound, well, in some sense, well, yes, you, so you need a boundary condition, but the boundary condition is simply that this metric shrinks, shrinks smoothly. Yeah. That is the boundary condition that you are choosing. So, no. Yeah. Um, Why is that the right thing in full quantum gravity? Well, it might, it might be the right thing or it might not be the right thing. Okay. But what I'm saying is that this reduces to the usual uh, results. To the usual, by usual, what I mean is uh, when everyone, everybody does calculations, for example, in inflation, they use the standard Euclidean vacuum prescription. Yeah, and this, this reduces to the standard Euclidean vacuum prescription. Right. And normally when you do that, um, you think about not perhaps this case where with curvature, perhaps you think about the case uh, where you have the flat slicing of the sitter. And uh, so far away, in the very far future, there isn't a big difference between having curvature or not. Um, and in the flat slicing, what one normally says is that one does the path integral, one starts in Lorentzian time, and one makes a small deviation into Euclidean time to make it conversion, right? So which is equivalent to the Feynman I epsilon prescription. So this, this is also in when we do um, when we do even vacuum quantum field theory, we choose the vacuum by doing this small deviation into Euclidean time. Right, but so we could we could decide not to choose the vacuum. You, yeah, you, you could choose an excited state and so on. So, but this is the this is what what chooses the vacuum and mm -hmm. um, yes. in, in ordinarily um, and it's the thing that chooses the vacuum. Well, that chooses the standard uh, vacuum in cosmology. Some people, one could disagree and say that one should not choose that vacuum. One should choose a different vacuum, right? Well, one could just say one doesn't know yet. One doesn't, well, we, we do know, I think we do know that uh, the expansion of the universe doesn't produce new particles, so even today. So that I view is as, as evidence that this is uh, in the right track. Well, certainly everything's consistent with it that we know in yeah, the data, yeah, yeah. But, but there's room for... Yeah, yeah, maybe, maybe yeah, the, yeah, so any, any new proposal of uh, producing particles had to be consistent with the fact that uh, we don't have any evidence for this particle yeah, production. Yeah, as you know, the, is not all that constraining. This is a conceptual point, whether there's a unique yes. mm -hmm. wave function that you know, we understand. Yeah, no, one, one, could, one could certainly say that, well, this, this, is, this might only work for a number of fee-folds, which is uh, small, uh, relatively small. Uh, it's the scumbling time of the sitter, and then after that, you start producing all kinds of particles. Um, so one, one could say things like this. They are, even those making, things are marginally, marginally. I'm not making a counterproposal. I'm just saying we don't. It's a question we don't know the answer. And yeah, yeah, yeah. Certainly, it's not a question. Yeah, yeah, I, yeah. You, one, one could have something different. All I'm emphasizing is that um, this choice of contour, especially in this flat slicing point of view, is, is what we normally use and is what agrees with the experiment so far. Now, as usual, theories are not uh, are not confirmed. They someone they might yeah, be ruled just, out. It's, so it's this is a theory that hasn't been ruled out. It's not the unique <laughs> thing that could, it's not. It's by far not the unique thing that could be the experiment. Yes, yes, yeah. there might be. A, yeah, but but. Yeah. Yes. Well, just to address uh, Eva's question, yeah. right? I don't think we, at least, have any argument that the state is is uh, unique, right? That yeah. the state is unique. It only has very good properties, just as yeah. you're yeah. as you're describing. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. 
So the view is that whatever people call a final theory consists of, uh, nowadays yeah. uh, consists of two parts, a theory of uh, dynamics and a theory of what the state of the universe uh, right, is. Right. And you well, test with predictions the combination. Yeah. One could conjecture that there's an unfinished task of unification there. Yes. Right. Uh, why do we have this division? Right. It's a very space timey kind of uh, thing to have initial conditions. I agree. Yeah. So I think it's an unsolved problem. Right. But uh, one should work on yeah. it. Yeah. No, I, I agree. It. Yeah. So, so, the, so the, the, the reason. So let me just say one. Well, this is a standard thing, but the reason one expects that there might be a theory of initial conditions is that. Well, here they have the wave function when you have A very small, and it looks like the center, like of the Schrodinger problem, where we just put the boundary condition for the wave function. Um, and so that's a reason to expect, perhaps, that the complete theory might have a, a, some theory of initial conditions. In just one brief comment. So there, it may be a very space-timey thing that, you have to, that you're allowed to specify, say, initial conditions that are different. But, uh, if you just think about it in terms of quantum mechanics, uh, generally you expect there to be many states in a given yes. quantum mechanical theory. Sure. Yeah. However, you think of specifying this, the use of initial is not, not really right because what what is initial about it? No, right. no, that's to not. have a to have a notion of initial and final, you have to have a space time already. No, that's what I'm saying is that if if the theory of quantum gravity is a quantum mechanical theory, there could well be you know different states in it. I never said the word initial when I said that. Just different states. Okay. I think you're agreeing with me, so I'll shut up. <laughs> to give an example that we all know, if, if we do this in two dimensions, then, of course, without ever saying the word initial and just talking about Euclidean path integrals, there are many, many states corresponding to all the excited states of the string and so on. And we don't, you know, throw all of them but one out in that context. So uh, I think the right. question right. is completely open. I, I, I completely agree that if you're just saying, you know, we want to choose that state so that we fit the data, this is a good way to do it. Right. Again, the data no. doesn't say that. Yeah. <laughs> so I, this is a way. What, what the, a way, but it's not, yeah. This is, well, yeah. What theory are you in here? So you're in gravity plus uh, Gravity plus field, scalar field. The, with the theory but, that Woodard wrote uh, some But say, say the potential, I just want you to tell me what properties the potential should have so that uh, yeah, uh, any, any, so, kind of makes yeah, sense. Yeah, so any, any theory of slow roll inflation, would, this, this makes sense. What if the potential has some place where it's negative, so like ADS is a solution, semi-classically? Um, um, well, it might depend on how you can't run it off regularly, then. Yeah. Well, maybe it has a visitor minimum and an ADS minimum, let's say. Well, the short answer is I don't know. I don't know if uh, anyone has uh, looked at this. I'm thinking of potentials of the form. Um, so some, some, something like this. Yeah. Okay. So and we fix the observed value now of phi and A, and then we go back in time, and there is some value of phi around here. Um, it may be complex. I, so that's uh, the type I of potential I'm thinking, in this, in thinking about in this discussion. Like Skype, so. um, Sorry, what, can you say again what you pointed to that, that origin of that plot and said that gave you a theory of initial condition? Can you say again what you meant? Well, this is the analog. I mean, this is a very naive point. I mean, it's just uh, in the same way that in the <coughs> In the Schrodinger equation, so if this was the Schrodinger equation uh, for the radial part of the wave function of an atom, we have a boundary condition at the origin right, that selects a particular wave function. Um, then uh, we might expect that in the context here, we will also select one particular uh, wave function, uh, the boundary conditions at small a, we select a particular wave function, and that then when time emerges, so here the emergence of time is, is related to going here to the oscillatory part of the wave function. So I'm being really slow. I mean, it's true there's a boundary condition there, yeah. but there are many states of an atom that are consistent with that. Uh, no, because we, we have this uh, energy condition. Right? Oh, oh, okay, sorry. sorry. And, then, and you postulate no degeneracy. Right, right, right. And that's no right. De zero yeah, yeah, so there is, yeah, that's right. Um, 
Okay, so we have um, now one one funny feature of this uh, wave function proposal is that uh, for the case of S3, it produces uh, besides this piece that is pretty nice, it produces a piece which contains uh, an m Planck squared or h squared, so some constant, um, and here h squared is the value of h when um, when the length scale of curvature reaches the horizon. So when you extrapolate it backwards, when that um, radius of curvature, which could be very large now, uh, reaches the size of the horizon during inflation, uh, that value of h is the one that appears here. Okay, this is also this can also be written as uh, m Planck uh, to the fourth power divided by b at phi star. Phi star is the value of phi at which the universe collapse, shrinks to a sphere. So this is called process of shrinking. Uh, in complex space occurs in, in an, over roughly any fold. So, um, so and this is uh, well, this has always been a problem with this uh, proposal uh, that uh, it uh, it w it gives uh, an exponentially large probability for things where the potential is uh, is smaller for regions where the potential is smaller. So, yes. The, um, th this th there should be a place where I mean, is phi dot like close to zero at, at this point phi star? Yeah, yeah, here, here if I dot this zero. There, but there you're already in Euclidean. So yeah, we're already in Euclidean, yes. I thought you were just evolving. Yeah, no, it's, it's, it's not zero here, so this is a complex solution. Yeah. Okay, okay. Yeah, so it's, uh, <coughs> yeah, people have discussed uh, examples. I guess uh, Thomas could talk more about this. Are you planning to talk more about this? I might. Okay, yeah. yeah. So, uh, anyway, so, but morally it's the same as this, except that there is a bar in H, so exactly where, where, what the value is when this happens. Um, just to, so I, I view this as a, as a problem. So people have uh, various attitudes to this problem. Um, my attitude is that it's an important problem. Um, uh, other people have the attitude that um, this is a problem that only arises when you have uh, but this is an issue that only arises when you have a uh, global de Sitter minimum, and it's the right answer in those uh, cases. And it is just saying that it's much more likely to be at the de Sitter minimum than to be anywhere else. And if you take this as a measure, and even if, even if you put in anthropic constraints, uh, it will give you the probability that you are mostly a Boltzmann brain. And since we think we are not Boltzmann brains, then this is evidence that there isn't a global de Sitter minimum. Uh, that's one point of view. Uh, and that this whole story would be uh, solved once uh, once we consider uh, the correct string landscape that contains all other kinds of minima with <coughs> negative and, and zero cosmological constant. And the fact that we could go to those minimums presumably will uh, solve this problem. Um, and um, okay, so the existence of those uh, other minima and the evolution of the wave function in those other regions, even though there are regions we cannot see. Uh, still would uh, solve this problem. That's uh, one attitude. Um, well, I mean, before no. you add those things, you seem to have reproduced from Wheeler DeWitt that what we're just the usual kind of thermal physics of the sitter space, right? So that, oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. So that's, this. That's an argument that what you did was, was correct. Yes, right? yes, yes. So, yeah, this, this, this in, in the case that uh, there is a global minimum, gives answers which are reasonable. Um, and uh, it agrees yeah, also if you have. Yeah. yeah, yeah, this factor is C2. This is the entropy of the sitter. Right. Uh, so what, I thought what Andre says to this is fine, but that's a statement about equilibrium the, or Yeah, the final state. Yeah, yeah. the yeah, final state, right. not the initial state. So what does it have to do with? Um, well, that you could say that, but uh, here the philosophy of uh, Haldane and Hawking is that this gives you the probability amplitude of, uh, of this particular universe. So let, let me try to, to say it in a way that uh, I like a bit more. So. So, so are you going to talk about the outgoing boundary conditions? Or, uh, the, what well, sorry, the, uh, the other wave function. There, you've taken one solution here. Yeah, no, I'm only going to talk about this one solution. Okay. So the problem with the other one is that it doesn't produce the fluctuation. So let's say that this is the observable universe, right? The observable universe has some uh, fluctuations, right? These fluctuations are correctly given by uh, this type of uh, Euclidean prescription or this type of vacuum choice. The observable universe could have a very tiny curvature of order, let's say, 10 to the minus 5, right? It's almost indistinguishable from the current curve, I mean, almost unmeasurable. Uh, 
of course, the current bounds are much higher than 10 to the minus 5. But, um, 10 to the minus 5, you couldn't possibly distinguish it. Um, so imagine that we have two different behaviors outside the, our horizon. So one is, OK, this was just a fluctuation, and it goes over to the landscape and internal inflation or whatever. That approach doesn't give you a, a, a precise measure, but you need to put in a measure by hand as an extra thing to the theory. Um, but here, or, or we could have a situation where we have a very, 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 very large sphere. Uh, right? So it's, we have a curvature for the 10 to the minus 1. We have this huge uh, sphere. Um, it's mostly outside our horizon. It's almost indistinguishable from what we have. Now, if we had this, this sphere, so the probability for, uh, it is natural to, to ask, well, what's the probability that this, the radius of this sphere is larger or smaller, or the curvature is larger or smaller? Right? It's not a calculation that is very different from the calculation we do for ordinary curvature, right? It's just, the, the cal it's just a, normally we talk, talk about curvature fluctuations, which are small oscillating curvature fluctuations. Here we have a bigger, it's like a zero mode of the, curvature fluctuation, uh, constant mode. Um, and for this constant mode, if we were to calculate the, the wave function using the, the same prescription that we use uh, for the small fluctuations, uh, we get this uh, huge, well, this factor, which would tell us that it's much more probable for this sphere to be smaller. And, um, and this is a calculation that uh, we can do purely in the context of inflation, which is uh, where we trust the other answer, and it's, it's experimental. It seems to be experimentally correct. So um, I'm not applying this to the current universe. Where it's to the current, I'm not. If we set here the current cosmological constant, then we have big problems. But uh, we have even bigger problems. But even even putting here the value of the cosmological constant during inflation, you have some problem. So you want to go to large or large, small volume? Smaller. Yeah, the curvature would want to be bigger, bigger curvature, and um, yeah. You said you want to start inflation lower on the potential. Exactly, yeah. You want to start. Lower. Yeah, yeah. This is just, yeah, smaller. that's right. That's right. Okay, so, but so, yeah. so now you're saying. It's a huge uh, force to, uh, let's say, probability force for getting you down the potential. Yeah. So, so if you take this to its logical conclusion, then you're actually saying this doesn't fit the data. Right. So the, for the zero mode, we have a big disagreement between theory and experiment. Yeah. Between this kind of theory and experiment. So that's why I view it as a big problem, because it's a very simple extension of the rules we ordinarily apply, uh, and uh, it seems to be, uh, be given a huge disagreement. There was a lot of discussion uh, last week on infrared effects in cosmology. Um, so and what happens when you have long distance and so on. This is not the distance which is much, much bigger. I mean, it's just uh, fact, this factor. Uh, yeah. So but we're familiar with ordinary quantum systems where yes. there could be like a compact hyperbolic space yes. is my favorite example, where uh, the you know the physics of the zero mode is is tachyonic, so the right way to treat the zero mode is as a scattering problem against a yes. inverted harmonic oscillator. Yes. The higher modes are not tachyonic and can yes. be treated yes. in, the, in, a, yes. in the normal yes. way, and, and and there that's just an example where yes. very clearly you do treat the Yes. Well, like from the higher ones. Yeah, that could be. So it could be that this mode needs to be treated differently, and but uh, I don't know. The, a consistent way. I, I don't know any mathematically. No, no. Something that follows from the equations of the theory very logically as this. So this is very well motivated by the equations of the theory, and um, it's given the wrong answer. So does this mean GR doesn't work for very long distances, or does it mean that? We don't it's know the right was. answer. This is the right answer for de Sitter equilibrium. You've, you've done it's it. It's given the this wrong answer for our universe. So that's, that's right. Yeah. Juan. Yes. Can, can I just want understand one thing about this story? The, this is relevant. Correct me if I'm wrong. Only if I insist on trying to compare the probabilities for different classical solutions. Exactly. Right? Yeah. Yeah. If I just think about the fluctuations around one classical solution, this is an overall constant, and you just. Yeah, but you can view this as also different classical solutions. I mean, they are of the same order in M Planck, right? As a function of the metric fluctuation, they are of the same order in M Planck. It's not, we're not comparing two different Planck orders. So, um, so if we. If we look as a, as a function, so we look at the wave function as a function of h. So this, uh, these are basically um, similar, right? Both are proportional to m Planck squared. But That's isn't the first one coming from the classical action of the? Yeah, bo both both of them are coming from evaluating the classical action on a solution. 
So the fact that uh, we have this large M plank here means that the actual fluctuations that you will have, this is a strongly suppressed Gaussian, yeah. will be very small. So, but this is the same statement that you are familiar with, with the fact that um, if you are doing three-level computations in field theory, that's the same as uh, evaluating the action on the classical solution. <coughs> a classical solution with co complex boundary conditions like this one. So that's the that's that's the standard. It's completely standard. It's what we do in flat space. It's a very minor uh, change in well, it's not a change in the rules. It's a minor extension just to this uh, curved universe, and uh, we we seem to get an answer. Which now you might say you, you want to treat the zero mode differently in this Sitter context. So here you can go to ADS uh, and ask how do we treat this in ADS, in particular in Euclidean ADS. So let's see if uh, Euclidean ADS has anything uh, more or less uh, related to this story. So the diagram of Euclidean ADS is very similar to, uh, to this. So we could uh, be choosing uh, a metric which, uh, um, yeah, so a few, a few things about, well, let me see. So let, let's, let's uh, talk about uh, Euclidean ADS and uh, its dual CFT and what we can learn uh, if we assume that uh, this equivalence is correct, what uh, we can learn about these issues. Um, well, let's first uh, do the mini superspace approximation. So here, the potential as a function of A uh, for positive, um, so, um, so it looks roughly like this uh, when the curvature of space is positive. Um, and so we are always in the forbidden region. So we are going to be interested here in large A. We are always in the forbidden region. Um, and, um, and because we are interested in the zero energy solution. Uh, and that's fine because we are always dealing with a Euclidean solution. Right? So we have this Euclidean uh, space. The wave function, actually, when you go and uh, try to calculate uh, what we normally do, uh, evaluating the classical action, it's a wave function that again grows in this direction. So it's exponentially growing, uh, an exponentially growing wave function in that direction. So we have psi, which is c to the minus the classical action. And, um, and this gives a growing uh, piece. This normally we write it as e to the, again, there is m Planck uh, squared, a cubed, let's say in four dimensions. So that's a divergent piece. And then there is another piece. There are some subleading diversions. It's not too important, similar conceptually. And uh, there is a finite piece here, um, which uh, asymptotically becomes independent of A, of the large size. And this is what we normally identified with the finite piece of the conformal field theory um, partition function. OK. OK. Now, um, so one. Uh, one point, uh, one first point is um, <clears throat> in this context, we could imagine choosing uh, different wave functions. So we could imagine, this is one tail of the wave function. If we, we could imagine changing the coefficient of this, uh, of this uh, piece of the wave function, right? If we were to change the boundary conditions here, we would, um, so we, we might say, well, we don't know what's happening here. So we could change this uh, wave function a little bit, change the overall coefficient a little bit. But if we were to change the overall coefficient, then uh, we wouldn't agree with the CFT. So CFT tells us that there is a well-defined uh, coefficient. So somehow um, it is choosing that for us. And I view this as indirect evidence that uh, indeed the idea that there is a well-defined uh, boundary condition here at the origin is correct. Uh, you might also ask uh, whether these issues for the... Can't the CFT probably fixes it uniquely? Except for possible subleading. No, no. Well, there are here subleading terms, especially in, in this uh, three-dimensional case that we're talking about. Um, this uh, is essentially fixed. I mean, it's fixed. But is there any freedom in the decaying branch? No. Uh, well, if you're, yeah. So you can imagine here that you can choose whatever in the decaying branch, and by choosing whatever here, um, and we can uh, we can change this coefficient. Yeah. So th this that was is. That my question. Yeah, so this is a situation where we are we are fixing the coefficient of this one, and since there are these two branches, it's, uh, I think it translates into, well, in particular, we need some, um, well, let, let me say it differently. So if, if we were just uh, doing uh, wave functions in this problem, we could pick any 
uh, any normalization here. Yeah, maybe I should say this. I think I didn't say it properly. Let me see. So here we have an asymptotic region, and in principle, we can change the normalization of this guy. Right? Um, and um, so the fact that there is a preferred normalization, I view it as evidence that there is a unique wave function of the universe. Um, So, well, so that or, or to take an extreme example, you could say maybe I just want the decreasing wave function. Well, the decreasing, we, we don't have an access to a direct access. Ac well, at least it's not what the ADSFT is about, about the decreasing wave function. Yeah, that's the key problem. So that's, uh, that's an important point. So if you have some other theory where the decreasing wave function is uh, arbitrary, yeah, we cannot, we cannot have a, an access to it, yeah. However, uh, it's important that the normalization, the value of this uh, increasing piece is, seems to be fixed. And we, what we, about we the can ambiguity and choice of boundary conditions where you can have um, relations between the decreasing and increasing wave function instead of just Dirichlet? Um, I, I think for, for gravity, we, we always choose Dirichlet. I, I don't know how to choose. Uh, well, at least the standard ADSFT involves choosing the for for gravity. I mean, for other fields you can choose other things, but for, for gravity, gravity when oh, you for choose yeah. yeah, for gravity when you choose something other than Dirichlet, you tend to get ghosts. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. Don wrote a paper where he was analyzing the other boundary conditions with gravity. Um, so a lot of things change, of course, when you go from ADS to DS. Yes. Yes. So in what sense is this evidence for the, the cosmological case? Well, let's see. Let me make one more point, and you'll see that I think it's some kind of evidence. So, um, so you can ask. Uh, so, in the same way that here we got a finite piece in the in the action, we can ask whether we get the finite piece also uh, here that is independent of a, that is proportional to e to the some factor m Planck square or something like this with some number. Mm -hmm. um, and indeed, indeed, we get such a factor, um, and it's essentially the same factor we get in in ADS. <coughs> Sorry, DS, um, and in fact, in fact, the DS and ADS calculations are almost identical. It's just this contour in the in the. So this is the DS contour. This is the sphere contour. Uh, so this is four, DS four, and if you chose this contour, you would have ADS four. And so it's all, it's exactly the same calculation, and you get uh, the same the same answer. Um, and furthermore, this answer has been computed with. Uh, it has been compared to the partition function of CFTs in many cases, in many cases where you can calculate these partition functions of CFTs. So there are some cases where you know the dual CFT, and you can calculate the partition function, and you can compare and find a precise agreement with this formula. Is this just a just... conformal anomaly or something? No, no, this is in 3D. So this is, oh, this three, is a this is three dimensional yeah. CFT. And these calculations have been done using supersymmetric. These are these calculations have been done in n equal to two supersymmetric theories or higher supersymmetry, and they have been done using uh, these localization techniques. So, so for example, in the um, in the BJM theory, that was done and it was uh, com com compared. And so, so that all, that all is great, and yeah. ADS CFT works beautifully. Yes. I'm confused about the leap between that and the cosmological case. It's not as simple as doing some continuation from one to the other, we know. Well, I, I agree it's not as simple, but uh, all, all I'm saying is that the rules that, uh, these rules that are, uh, I mean, so th these rules for calculating the, the cosmological case are a very minor extension of what we do for just the, the flat sl slicing of, AD, of DS. Just we do the same in the curve slicing and it gives us this answer. Um, can, can I turn the question around actually yes. and ask you, you, you mentioned the, more complicated possibility in the DS case of decays and so on. Yes. What would that be in the ADS? Um, well, in the in the ADS analog, well, like, um, um, you you could have situations where where um, yeah, sorry. Um, I mean, it seems something to the boundary, right? It's well, I mean, if so, so I guess you can have situations where the boundary is kind of different in different regions. So we have CFT one here. CFT2 here, and uh, some kind of domain wall between them. Uh, so this, uh, in, in the Sitter context, it would be a bubble nucleation with some other Sitter space. Uh, but, yeah. 
Well, I agree with Eva that, that this, this is not the derivation that there is a contradiction. I'm not saying that we should drop uh, gravity. Gravity is wrong. And I, I think it's a, it's a problem that we should understand better. And may, maybe there is, we should treat it differently for some reason. Or uh, maybe it's the reason why we should go to the landscape. Maybe it's, uh, but um, even. Um, uh, sorry to keep interrupting, but that, that part of why I asked the last question is does going to the landscape. Well, to me, it's not clear that it will solve the problem. So re recall that going to a landscape also involves tunneling. So in order to populate the landscape, you need tunnelings between different solutions. Right. Um, and um, well, tunneling also involves uh, doing calculations in Euclidean gravity and reinterpreting these calculations as tunneling probabilities. And if uh, we have here a very reasonable thing that uh, gave us some physically wrong answer, well, that, we, that contradicts, uh, apparently contradicts experiment. Um, how, how do we know we're also also calculating those things in the other situations correctly? Uh, but tunneling so. usually gives the decreasing wave function if you're going through a barrier. Yeah, that's right. So, so here, if you, if, you, if you start from small and you want to go out, uh, indeed, as you... Or, or from somewhere else. Right? Actually, it, yes. it gives yes. the decreasing one plus an exponentially small coefficient times the increasing one. So, I don't... I don't in standard quantum mechanics, you, you get both. Mm -hmm. It's just that the coefficient of yeah. the increasing one is no. so small that it's as, as small as the. Yeah. So, okay. I think uh, I think I was ending here. So that's that's all I have to say. presentation to later to another slide. So are you prepared roughly how many minutes for it? Ten? Um, although it will expand with discussion. Yeah. So, uh, there is one little point I may want to add. Yeah, so let, let's move that to later. <laughs> 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 we can have more discussion and we'll, we'll try to... Hey, can I make a comment about what you said so far? I mean, so we had this other description of the sitter space, which is just the static patch and or, or, or say of a potential like that, right? So it's a static patch, semi-classical gravity. And now you did Willard DeWitt Voodoo, you got exactly the same answers. <laughs> and I think it's right. So it said quantum gravity voodoo is not going to fix our static patch picture. That was the right picture. Those are the right probabilities. And I don't think there's anything wrong. I think, I think those are the right calculations for this theory that you wrote there. Right. But, um, so if I have this theory, um, and I can compute for the probability of a universe like this, right? And I would get th this answer, and it would be wrong. Exactly. So yes. my conclusion is yes. you, you've just shown again that this theory is not the right theory for our universe. Well, but you see, that it, it, it is exploring the, so this is ex exploring the potential in a region, in, a, in a just this bounded region here, right? Between here and here. The potential could be doing all kinds of things other way, uh, in other positions, and it's, I, I don't see why it would change this answer. So if, if the potential in other positions is going to change this answer, why doesn't it change the answer also for small fluctuations? Why, why only for this big So big I have a question about the, that picture. Did it matter that that was a big sphere, or could it have been? Uh, well, I made it a big, big sphere so as not to contradict the current bound on R, right, no, no, on curvature. Suppose it were a big hyperbolic space or something. Uh, yeah, if it is a big hyperbolic space, so you, you could do this. Yeah, so you could take a hyperbolic space here, or a torus, um, and then. Uh, you could do exactly the same thing at this hurdle hawking discussion. And in the complex, so for example, for a torus, you would pick a complex solution where one of the cycles of the torus shrinks. For example, that would be a choice. Uh -huh. And they give actions which are, they have the opposite sign and of reasonable things. They give reasonable things of so torus and so on. Wait, reasonable meaning? Reasonable that they don't have a high probability for being small. Oh, then why, why don't we conclude that we, you showed that the universe is not positively correct? No, because the, we, we should select the wave function with the highest probability. So Why should one, we do that? That's not, I was wondering. Well, that's what we do in ordinary physics. I, I, I don't know. So but can we exist in, uh, does do anthropic considerations enter at this point? Well, that's also why I chose this one. So the anthropic considerations don't, certainly don't bound the, the curvature to, to within the, the limit that 
cast today. So it could have been measured by Planck, let's say, and it wouldn't contradict any anthropic consideration. So, so you're saying if, I, if you took any other topology aside from a sphere, with, for each topology, the results would be sane in terms of the size of yeah, the Yeah, it's sane, yeah. Mm -hmm. And there's an, the sphere is an extremely special case. It's very it's, special, it, yeah. Right? So by some counting idea of a measure, I would say there's an infinite number of compact hyperbolic spaces. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, maybe. Okay. Maybe. Very okay. well. Well, but can't you calculate that? I mean, then you have this e to the s factor. Yeah, you can, you can. You, you, you would get the minus sign very large, and then maybe if we count them all, I don't know whether There's it's... There's an infinite number of the, How do you regulate that? <coughs> Yeah, maybe. And it's just our tough luck that we're never going to see the hyperbolic geometry. There are many things we'll never see. Yeah. You can predict it at some point. If, if we can, if, if there really were a sharp argument that <laughs> everything would make sense. Yeah, so this, this, this. The reason it should work for small fluctuations and not for big ones is that this is a nice. This way of constructing the wave function is a nice way of getting a wave function that has the right symmetries. And the small fluctuations are, are controlled by, by the symmetries of the sitter space. And, you know, say inflation started from tunneling or something, but then at short distances, it's, it's the well, same. I remind you that they're all this alpha vacua where the fluctuations are. Also have the conformal symmetry, but they're not. Uh, That's right, but those are not been cost. So, so this is a nice way of constructing something which approaches, which is non-singular at short distances and has the right symmetries. But that doesn't tell you it gives you the right probabilities for large scale stuff. Right? Yeah. I mean, oh, in particular, if you have other regions that are not the sitter, then you don't expect the sitter symmetries to control the full problem. You only expect it to control the small fluctuations around. Uh, so. <coughs> okay. Uh, oh yeah, the other the other thing I wanted to say is that. Um, this Julia de Witt equation is also useful for thinking about the RG, in, uh, but I won't say anything about it. or questions, uh, like about the RG for one? <laughs> Anything? Anything? Well, can I just ask for a clarification? Is, so is the only <coughs> argument against an anthropic resolution of this problem the fact that the spatial curvature has not been measured to be larger? Yeah, that's right. I think it's a strong argument because the, we would need to be like extraordinary. <coughs> Well, again, I think it's a okay, no, the, the question, I, I think your question has two, two parts. So one is, if that's enough for, for resolving this problem, if we only consider, let's say, curvatures that are relative, I mean, for inflationary situations. But if we put the cosmological constant today, then uh, anthropics doesn't, uh, doesn't fix the problem. Because the, 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 fact, the, the, the large exponential factor that we get from the cosmological constant today overwhelms the suppression of creating ourselves with all our memories and so on. And so, on. so that this would that concept would predict that we are also on brains. That's the answer the end. Do you understand this correctly that you assume uh, the universe is compact. Uh, it's a sphere of it yes. grows. But uh, one can imagine a, a, a different problem. Uh, we only care what uh, happens uh, in the universe at a certain place, uh, yeah. at a certain time, and uh, so we can uh, draw a, a light cone uh, from where we are, uh, going to the past, yeah. and consider a theory with uh, <coughs> light-like boundaries, yeah. uh, which is not, not compact. Can you, can you write equations for, for, the, for this stuff? Yeah, certainly one, one would think that that should be the more physical way to do it, and that anything that is outside that light cone shouldn't matter for yeah, our right. measurements. Yeah. So in, in this way of doing things, you you see that it does matter. So and there is the question of whether it does or does not matter. So 
also proposed resolutions to this involve this landscape and so on, where it doesn't matter what mm -hmm. happens outside. So mm -hmm. I think, uh, well, the, the question of whether we can formulate a complete theory is just talking about these icons is, uh, well, people are trying to do this. I guess Tom Banks is trying to construct theories which only talk about this icon. But mm -hmm. um, yeah, we, we don't have a, a way to do it in string theory, let's say. Well, yes, a, a lot of us try and think about the sitter space just within a causal pouch has been just mm -hmm. alluded to. Yeah. The, the sitter space and its decays just within a causal pouch. So there are theories, mm -hmm. there are approaches that restrict to that. Anything further? Well, so this room is free until two, right? So when when are we going to do Guillermo's talk? I mean, uh, we could all go like get food and come back in here. Yeah, we were thinking possibly Friday. We'll confirm that, but that was the idea, I think, because well, yeah, that that probably works better. Okay, so we'll comment. Okay, lunch.